for now. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the regular council meeting for Monday, June the 28th. Uh, before we get into the regular council agenda, we do have uh, one item under the Committee of Adjustment agenda, so we'll call that meeting to order first. Uh, tonight, we have a public meeting held under Section 45, Sub 5 of the Planning Act to consider a minor variance application. Minor variance application A21-05 is for the property located at 301 Colonel Phillips Drive. The purpose and effect of the application is to request relief from Section 3.15.9 of Zoning Bylaw Number 38-2007 for parking requirements for a previously approved site plan uh, application, which was under file number 17-02 for a commercial shopping center and plaza development. The application is seeking relief from the parking regulations to permit a parking standard of one space per 19.1 square meters of floor area, whereas the zoning bylaw requires one space per 17 square meters of floor area uh, for a shopping center. Uh, I'll ask the clerk for the method of notice for tonight's public meeting. Notice of tonight's public meeting has been advertised in local media sources. Notice is posted on the town's website and property owners within a 60 meter radius have received notification. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll have a presentation by the town planner, Steve Weaver, uh, with a summary of written comments received, following which there will be an opportunity for questions from committee members, as well as members of the public. Uh, so with that, Steve, I will turn it over to you to present your report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a few brief slides just to present the application. Um, let me just bring that up. Does that come up okay? Yeah. Great. So um, the application is for 301 Colonel Phillips Drive. It's an application for uh, minor variance. And as we know, this is a commercial block located within the Summerhill subdivision along the southwest side of Highway 10 uh, and the southeast side of Colonel Phillips Drive. This is a, a bit of a dated air photo. Um, as we know, the plaza is now well under construction. Um, this is the approved site plan for the development. And as we know, there's a Tim Hortons operating in the east part of the site. Uh, with entrance off of Colonel Phillips Drive at the west end. Uh, and these other two buildings are nearing completion, buildings A and B, uh, both designed to have commercial retail units for a range and flexibility of different commercial uses, which are permitted in the C3 commercial zone that applies to the property. This site plan was approved back in 2017. And... Uh, the parking areas are located in between uh, Colonel Phillips Drive and building the buildings. Uh, the drive-through runs over here. Um, the parking really has been maximized on the property while accommodating all of the required fire routes, um, loading areas, waste enclosures, landscaping, um, setback from the highway, et cetera. Um, so the, the site has been approved based on it, this current layout and uh, is being developed in accordance with the uh, approved site plan. As the tenants uh, started to lease the various units available uh, through the buildings A and B, what the owner began to realize is that the assumptions made in calculating the parking supply uh, and parking provision on the site um, at the time of site plan approval is under supplying the mix of uses that uh, are proposed to lease the various uses um, because of the uh, differing parking standards in the zoning bylaw. So the parking standards vary by use. So retail stores have a different standard than restaurants. Um, as an example. And uh, due to the nature of the tenants that have um, been um, secured by way of lease for some of the units, uh, the, the parking requirement um, for the units that have been leased so far is almost as much as um, is available on site for parking. 
And the result of that is some of the, the units that haven't been leased yet would have very limited use um, and potentially no use opportunity unless uh, every time uh, uh, you know one of those remaining units were leased, uh, an application was made to uh, reduce the parking or if those units were kept vacant. And I think obviously the ideal scenario is that all of these units are leased um, for um, as many uses as possible and, and without you know, long vacancies while balancing that with making sure that there's adequate parking on the property as well. So one of the main benefits of having these multi-unit commercial units, uh, commercial developments is that um, you know, each of the uses typically has a bit different parking demand and turnover. Uh, you know, for example, there's higher parking demands um, at certain times of day, say the lunch hour and, um, you know, just before dinner hour um, for takeout restaurants. Um, whereas, say, the Tim Hortons is, is you know, probably busier uh, early in the morning. Um, would also have some peak traffic at, at lunch, and maybe less so at, at dinner. Uh, things like medical offices, which uh, Building A is being designed for, um, would have that same, you know, uh, parking turnover and time of day consideration. It would be more throughout the day um, and not so much uh, peaks in, in the morning and lunchtime. Um, similarly, barbershops aren't likely to be, um, you know, have the peak demands at the same times as, as restaurants. And the, one of the tenants identified uh, for building B as well uh, for two of the units as a convenience store. Um, and, and that would typically generate, you know, parking, um, quick turnover in terms of parking, like people don't typically shop in those stores for a long period of time, as well as parking demands throughout the day, not, not at the same time necessarily as the restaurant. So the, the plaza is designed to have shared parking for all of the tenants and for all of the uh, customers who visit those tenants. Um, not to reserve parking on a unit by unit basis. And uh, for that reason, um, if you were to supply parking on a unit by unit basis, you, you probably end up with way more parking than is required to actually fulfill the needs given that there's a shared parking area arrangement. So um, there is a definition in the zoning bylaw for what's referred to as a shopping center. Uh, it's defined as a mix of commercial uses. Uh, this site certainly qualifies. It's not intended for something like a shopping mall where all of the uses are inside with the same uh, common hallway. Uh, shopping centers include you know, multi-building sites. Um, basically the idea being if it's all under one ownership or all functioning as one main commercial shopping center, then you can have um, uh, a reduced or a common parking standard for the entire uh, site. So th the, the shopping center parking standard was not used when the uh, site plan approval was requested. Uh, the first table at the top of the slide shows the parking standards that were calculated um, based on the floor areas of the different buildings and 101 spaces were um, calculated as required based on the standards you see here, which are for retail stores and other commercial uses, as well as restaurants. Um, so that's the number of parking spaces that are provided on the site. Um, there was one space lost um, since the site plan approval because of an additional uh, small seg section of fire route um, and the turning radius required for the truck re resulted in the elimination of one space. Uh, but you can see here when parking is calculated at the proposed standard for a shopping center of one space per 19 square meters, which is actually a higher standard than, you know, what was used for these three buildings previously, um, you end up with a total requirement of 97 spaces for all the buildings. So there's a little bit of room to spare. Um, and that means that every time a tenant changes at the site, there doesn't have to be a recalculation of parking because it changes from a restaurant to a retail store or a dental office uh, to a convenience store. Or if there's changeover over time, uh, it doesn't have to be recalculated and, and new applications made to, to give exception for that. 
So with any variance, uh, there are four tests under the Planning Act that must be met. Uh, you'll find in our report that we've provided a summary of those um, tests. We've uh, concluded that the tests are met, that the application is minor, uh, that it's um, obviously the site plan's already been approved. So the, the development is appropriate and desirable for the property and that it conforms with the general intent of the zoning bylaw and the official plan. We circulated the application to all of the required agencies and departments and the results of that circulation are summarized in the report. Um, there have been no uh, objections uh, to the application uh, received so far. Uh, we are here, however, tonight to have a public meeting. There have been no public submissions regarding this application um, so far. And um, we have recommended that the variance be worded in a way to make it clearly tied to the approved site plan. So if this site were to redevelop or significantly change you know, further down the road, um, longer term, um, that there would need to be a reevaluation of the parking requirements based on the standards of the bylaw and that this standard is specifically for the site plan as approved. Um, MTO responded just indicating no comments or concerns. That's one key agency we wanted to make sure it was satisfied. Uh, NVCA uh, comments are also attached, uh, no concerns there. And uh, the Director of Development Operations has also uh, responded indicating no comments or concerns. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, should you have any? Thank you. Okay, thanks Steve. Uh, are there any questions from the committee? No. Uh, Madam Clerk, were there any uh, public members logged in to comment? No public members are registered for this meeting tonight. Okay. All right. Um, last call for comments or questions from the committee. Okay. Um, do any committee members have an issue with this? The, the recommendation is that, that we approve the, the minor variance request. Any objections to that? If, if not, I would ask that we get a, a motion to approve it. Uh, board member Bonato, seconded by board member Buffett. Okay, so the motion will read, after considering the application, the committee is satisfied that the request is desirable for the appropriate and continued use of the subject property, maintains the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw and official plan, and is minor in nature. Accordingly, the committee resolves to grant the request. The minor variance is granted in accordance with the site plan provided to the committee and attached here too, only to grant relief from section 3.15.9 table four, parking space requirement table, which requires a minimum number of off-street parking spaces at the rate of one space per 17 square meters of gross floor area for a shopping center to permit a minimum number of off-street parking spaces provided at the rate of one space per 19 square meters of gross leasable area for three commercial buildings and having a total combined gross floor area not exceeding 1,931 square meters in accordance with an approved site plan. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? That's carried. Okay. Anything else for Committee of Adjustment, Steve? No, just the one application tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. So can I have a motion to adjourn Committee of Adjustment? Board Member Hall, seconded by Bonato. All in favor? It's carried. Okay, so we'll call our regular council meeting to order at 647. And to begin, I would ask that those who are able, uh, please stand and uh, join us for the playing of the national anthem. <laughs>
All right, thank you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, including the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Chippewa, and the people of the Three Fires Confederacy. Uh, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest from any member of council for tonight's meeting? Councillor Buffett? Yes, um, in the regular agenda, uh, item number four of, in the report from the CEO regarding fee waivers, uh, the third item um, request from the Rotary, Shelburn Rotary. I'm a member of the Rotary Club, so I'm declaring a conflict. Okay. Um, and Madam Clerk, I there's a, a, a written submission, I think, that Councillor Buffett needs to uh, fill out as well. That's correct. That has to be provided in writing as well. Okay. Um, could, could you send that to Councillor Buffett? Sure. Yes. Okay. All right. Anybody else? No? Okay. All right. Uh, we get a motion to approve the minutes from the Committee of Adjustment and regular council meetings held June 14th. Uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Fegan. Is there any discussion on uh, either set of minutes? No? Okay. All in favor? That's carried. Okay. That brings us to public question period. I know we have at least one question, Madam Clerk. Yes, we've received a question from Lauren Dunlop. Uh, it states, will you be canceling Canada Day celebrations? Will you be putting the money you usually spend on fireworks towards something that could support Indigenous folks or a town initiative to better follow the TRC or do better in terms of Indigenous people? There is a second part to that as well. Mayor Wade Mills said that not much action has been taken yet towards the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's mini PACs recommendations because they don't want to rush to implement policy in a knee-jerk or haphazard way. Since the TRC came out six years ago, I would like to know how much longer will we have to wait to see changes? Reminding Council, the Indigenous people have been waiting over 150 years for changes, specifically on the easy ones to implement, such as recommendation number 57, where government is called upon to provide education to public servants on Indigenous history, the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights, and many more. Thank you for letting me submit my questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I did have an opportunity to, uh, um, to, to engage in some dialogue with, uh, with Lauren over the weekend uh, online, um, and, uh, and, and I'm glad she followed up with, uh, with some follow-up questions tonight. Um, I'll, I'll take each in turn. In, in terms of the first question with respect to Canada Day, um, I, I think the gravity of, of the situation re requires a slightly more nuanced question than, than simply do we cancel Canada Day or not. Um, and, and we will be opening this up for discussion during council inquiries, uh, which is the very next section on the agenda uh, after this so that we can talk about it as a group. Um, for my part, though, let, let me just say that I, I do certainly agree um, that, you know, a, a typical sort of event uh, for Canada Day as, as in years past, uh, you know, complete with fireworks and, and celebratory fanfare would, uh, would, you know, not only be tone deaf uh, this year, but, but I think it would also be disrespectful and, and narrow minded, um, you know, while, while we consider that thousands of our Indigenous brothers and sisters are are hurting and, and grieving right now. Um, so with that in mind, I do think that July 1st this year um, can actually provide us with a bit of a unique opportunity. Um, I, I think that we can certainly still acknowledge uh, in, in perhaps a quieter, uh, more understated way, um, the good that this country has and, and still does represent, uh, while also fully and, and properly acknowledging and reflecting upon the, the very deep uh, and, and lasting shortcomings that, that we're still wrestling with. Um, and, and I think we also then can consider, you know, um, what each of us can do uh, to, to be better going forward. Um, Chief DeLorme of, of uh, Cowess's First Nation uh, has called on all Canadians to listen, learn, unlearn, and start to heal. And uh, in, in my mind, if, if the developments and discoveries of the last few weeks have shown us anything, it's that we do still have a long way to go and, and a lot still to unlearn. Uh, 
uh, in, in this country. Um, Canada Day, I, I think, must be something for all Canadians. Um, and, and quite frankly, any true celebration can only be achieved, in, in my mind, when all Canadians are, are able to fully take part in that. Um, and, and so I, I think this year, um, you know, apart from quietly reflecting upon what we do have to be thankful for, um, you know, what, what we do have to be proud about as Canadians, we should, uh, all of us, spend the day uh, trying to resolve in our own minds uh, what each of us can do um, to listen, learn, unlearn, and, and start to heal. Um, so, so, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in, in some more depth in a few minutes. In terms of the second uh, question about the, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission recommendations, um, I, I did have the opportunity during, uh, during my discussion with Lauren over the weekend to, to share with her some of the, the, you know, the, the more notable steps that this council has taken, um, which I think are, are important ones, um, in, including the simple land acknowledgement, which, which we just read. Uh, we were one of the, the very first municipalities in Dufferin County to do that. Um, and and I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, uh, that, that we took the lead on that. Um, we, we've also named um, several streets uh, in the new Emerald Crossing development uh, after Indigenous names and, and in recognition of, of Indigenous culture and heritage. Um, specifically, though, with, with respect to the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission recommendations, uh, she's right. Uh, you know, the, these came out, um, you know, about six years ago. Um, and uh, they were actually, I guess, during the first year of the last term of council. Um, and, and six years is a long time to pass with, uh, without any action taken. Uh, but I think Lauren and, and anybody else who's watching tonight who, uh, who's taken a keen interest in this um, will we'll be happy to see that there is a notice of motion that's been prepared uh, and, and will be tabled later on in the agenda. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wait and, uh, and, and discuss that at the appropriate time. Uh, were there any other questions submitted, Madam Clerk? No, sir. Okay. All right, so that will move us right into council inquiries. So as I said, I, I do want to uh, discuss as a group uh, the, the Canada Day um, discussion. So I'll, I'll lead it off and then, uh, and then we'll open it up. Um, so I, I spoke with uh, Councillor Feagan uh, earlier today. Um, are, 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 sorry, Councillor Feagan, are, are you actual chair of the Canada Day Committee? I am, yes. Okay, yeah, thought so. Um, so, so the event that, that has been planned this year, and I, I just want to make sure that, that we're all kind of starting from the same, you know, basic set of facts. Uh, Lauren had mentioned, you know, the reallocating the budget for fireworks. Um, the event that's been planned for this year is a, is a toned down event to begin with. Um, there, there was no fireworks display that had been planned. There was no budget set for that. Um, but what the committee has been working hard to, to, uh, to plan is a family drive-in movie night uh, at Fiddle Park. Um, now, in, in discussing with Councillor Feagan, there had been some, some earlier discussions and plans, I think, to have uh, a virtual fireworks display um, before the, the film uh, commenced. And, and we've talked about maybe changing that slightly. And in, instead of doing a virtual fireworks uh, display, I think what we're going to do is, uh, is do a tasteful acknowledgement and message followed by a moment of quiet reflection. Um, in terms of the actual budget, uh, and, and Carrie or, or Councillor Feagan step in and correct me if I'm wrong here at any point, but, uh, but the cost of the drive-in movie has been generously sponsored uh, by Flato Developments. Uh, and, and I think the town's contribution in terms of public funds was, was less than $40, I think $37 and change. Yes, it, it will be minimal and uh, in kind services for um, just for public works, staking out the, uh, the area and garbage and, and cleaning the washrooms and that. Okay, so so unlike in years past, there, there is no big town budget that, that has been dedicated for Canada Day festivities or, or fireworks or for anything like that. Um, the other thing that uh, that we've discussed today, I've asked town staff about the possibility of lighting up town hall in orange. 
um, for Canada Day and, and uh, some days following. And, and I know staff is working uh, at this point to see uh, if, if that's a possibility. Um, so for my part, I, I think, you know, the, the modified scaled down event um, that, that I've just described, it does, you know, strike an appropriate balance. And, and I think it does sort of capture the spirit of, of what I had spoken about earlier. Um, but, uh, but, but I certainly do want to hear from the rest of the group. So with that, we'll, we'll open it up and, and have a discussion about this. Councillor Feigen. Yeah, I, I think I'd just like to echo um, your same sentiments that Mayor uh, Mills, the, um, the idea of, of having a, a low key event still go forward, uh, but certainly acknowledging the, the events in, 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 in re just recent past. Um, it, it, in, in my mind, it, it, it may not mean a lot, but it's, 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 it's trying to take steps forward in a partnership that is bringing everybody together, which in my mind is what Canada Day should be about anyway. Um, and, and having the acknowledgement about, uh, and, and the moment of silence for these, these uh, unmarked graves, I think is very, very important. And also gives an opportunity for those of us who may be turning a blind eye to these kinds of atrocities to actually sit down and reflect on this. So I think it could be a, a benefit in disguise in that sort of a sense. So I'm, I'm still firmly believe that uh, having something small go forward with that inclusion would be very beneficial. Okay. Anybody else? Councillor uh, Wagner. Yes, thank you very much, Mayor Mills. Um, there's really not um, a whole lot, I guess, that I can add um, as, you know, both yourself, uh, Mayor Mills and uh, Councillor Feigen has um, said it quite uh, fully, I guess you could say. So I, I just would um, sort of echo those comments. And, um, you know, I, I feel that I, the same type of uh, behavior, you know, where we need to continue moving forward. And although it's a small step, um, at least it's a step, right? We, we don't go forward if we don't move our feet forward. So um, I think that as Councillor Feigen suggested, a, a smaller scale down uh, type event with acknowledgement and a moment of silence um, is, is a start. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, you use the word uh, Mayor Mills uh, or words tone deaf. Um, and, and so I'm happy to hear and I'm sure the community as well is happy to hear that we are going to take a more responsible approach. I certainly don't believe that the event uh, should be cancelled. But as Councillor Feigen and Councillor Wegman has pointed out, uh, we could use this as an opportunity to strike the right tone and the right balance. And I, I believe, Mayor Mills, I think you'll probably be doing a, a message, maybe a video message uh, to that effect, uh, you know, at the beginning of this, uh, of this celebration that we're, we're scheduled to have. So I think as long as we demonstrate that we're not tone deaf and that we're striking the right balance, I think the community will appreciate that. But I also want to speak to the letter or the email that was submitted with respect to if we were to cancel it, you know, would we use those funds to... Um, facilitate initiatives that uh, would support our Indigenous community. And you spoke to some of the initiatives that we've taken, and certainly that's not an exhaustive list. Uh, what I would encourage uh, Ms. Dunlop, if she's watching or will be watching later, or to any other community member, is that the Town of Shelburne and Council and staff are certainly open, uh, certainly to suggestions as to how we can improve, and feedback is always welcomed. And I'd also encourage Ms. Dunlop, if she's watching to, if she has suggestions, uh, to speak directly to our uh, diversity and inclusion committee as that committee is also very open to uh, initiatives and ideas as to how we can make our community better. So by no means, the steps that we've taken is again, an exhaustive, an exhaustive list. Uh, we're certainly open to taking more steps forward to make sure that we have that reconciliation that is well-deserved at this level. Thank you. Good point. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Um, I, I do think some other uh, members of council do have some inquiries. So we'll move into that phase now. Councillor Wagner. Yes. Thank you very much, Mary Mills. Um, actually, I guess this sort of um, ties in with um, 
what we've been discussing uh, just recently here. Um, so I had a, um, an Indigenous community member reach out and, um, you know, provide a few suggestions and things like that as what we could do maybe as, uh, as council or, or as, as um, town, you know, representatives as a whole. Um, you know, she actually recommended that maybe during our meetings, um, which could potentially be, you know, sanctioned as almost like a delegation, um, either before the meeting begins or if we set aside a specific amount of time throughout the meeting, that we have a representative of the Indigenous community um, come to the, you know, well, I mean, right now it's virtual, so virtually attend our meetings and um, speak about um, history, culture, and and or um, stories. So, um, you know, maybe we could dedicate, um, and I don't want to make it seem like it's rushed where we only dedicate 10 minutes or, or something like that, but if we could set aside, uh, you know, a, a, a time that, um, you know, we could have, you uh, someone you know attend and just speak a little bit about um whatever you know we sanction before the meeting or, or whatnot whether it be a story or a piece of history or you know even if it's local history and and um you know speaking uh, about that um so i thought that that was a, a pretty uh, neat idea in order to uh, educate not only ourselves but anyone who would be watching or attending um, and, uh, it doesn't even need to be every meeting. It could be once a month, um, you know, whatever we could come up with. Right. Um, but yeah, just, just something in that nature in order to, uh, further, um, you know, honor those uh, who were here before us. Okay. So I don't know how, I mean, I don't know if we have to make a motion for that or if we want to discuss that at a later time or I mean we would obviously need to reach out to um you know uh, indigenous community members and and leaders uh around us in order to facilitate that too so I don't know if I leave that with town staff uh, Denise thanks Mary Mills so that would fall within an educational component so if you would like us to come up with what format could best meet those priorities we can certainly come back to you on how that would work, whether it's a standalone special meeting or okay. it's incorporated into certain meetings throughout the year and then how others could be invited to provide information based on a set of criteria, we can certainly put that together. Okay, I think that would be wonderful. Okay. I have a few more, but I don't know if somebody wants to go ahead of me um, or if you want to just start. Yeah, yeah, we'll. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, my next one, I guess, is just a quick um, sort of question about the um, the CIP and when we're going to be formally um, adopting that. Um, I was uh, doing a little bit of research, and um, do we have a downtown core um, built form standard? Do we do we have something like that? Um, it would allow obviously um, a guideline for developments that or renovations that were going to be happening in the downtown core to um, abide by or, or follow um, a set you know, rule or, or guidelines in order to how the buildings would look and um, you know, how tall they could be and, and things like that. I know that we have like, obviously we have a, a zoning bylaw um, but this would be something uh, that would sort of tie in with the zoning bylaw and the CIP. Um, uh, what was it? Toronto has something, it's called the downtown plan and policies and Guelph has something as well. And there's the downtown 21 report that is um, from Mississauga. So those sort of reports uh, seem to me to be a lot like our CIP. And so they work hand in hand with the zoning bylaw and um, just making sure that, you know, when we have developers coming to us, um, putting in buildings in our, you know, downtown core or, or around what we would classify as our downtown core, um, you know, creating a standard of what we feel heritage type buildings should look like so that we avoid having big giant white buildings. <laughs> I see that uh, 
Well, our, both our CAO is raising her hand and, and our town planner has uh, come on the screen. So Denise, do you wanna? I, I'll take part A just to confirm it's our intention <laughs> to bring back the CIP and the recommended bylaw that's necessary in, in, in August, if not the first meeting in September. Okay. And then I'll defer to Steve for the second part about whether or not, I'll just note we don't have prescriptive requirements on what facade or buildings need to look like. And there's reasons for that. I'll let Steve provide more information. Sure, so through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, it was quite a long time ago that a kind of pilot was done where a, a community improvement plan was prepared and um, tested basically for I think a three or four year period. It was uh, 2006 or thereabouts. Um, a series of programs were created and some funding was allocated and uh, facade improvement guidelines were put in place. Now, the program and guidelines were really uh, designed not to apply unless somebody was seeking funding assistance for their improvements. So it was like an incentive program. If you wanted to make improvements to the front of your building and you wanted some financial assistance with that, you could get such final financial assistance or relief from, from costs from the town if you met those guidelines. Um, there wasn't any, for that four year period, there wasn't any uptake to the program. So money had been um, earmarked um, and budgeted, uh, but, but uh, nobody really took advantage of it. Um, so it's it's really a long time coming to bring that back to the fore um, through the through the new CIP. Um, just before uh, meetings went virtual last year, uh, we had you're marked a March 2020 meeting to bring forward the final CIP um, with a bylaw specifically defining the community project areas that the CIP would apply to. Um, as well as the um, types of incentive programs that might be offered and some budget related considerations. So uh, based on discussions with staff earlier today, the, the goal would be to try and bring uh, this back um, for the August meeting with some greater definition on um, the, the incentive programs that would be created um, and when budgeting might occur for those programs. Okay, so is there a way that we can create something, uh, you know, that is a little bit more um, definitive and, and, you know, applies to all, not just those who are, I guess, asking for funding or, or whatnot? I mean, uh, I would think that, you know, if places as large as Mississauga and Toronto can have specific set guidelines as to how they want their downtown core to look, um, you know, that we could do the same thing, right? So um, I'm just hoping that maybe that's something we can look into implementing and creating. For sure. Um, and, and we can comment further on that when we bring uh, the CIP forward. Um, so I, need, I haven't looked at the CIP document for a while since uh, really since we were gonna bring it forward last March. Um, and it does have some design guidelines in it. So they may not be as specific as council wants in terms of design guidelines for building improvements in the downtown area. Um, unlike, there are some oh, limitations on what the town can do uh, as it relates to uh, controlling or architectural control with, within the downtown area. Uh, the Planning Act says um, you can require sustainability measures and, and that kind of thing, but you can't dictate the kinds of materials and colors that, that people use. So that's why the, the previous CIP tied it to incentives so that if somebody's applying for funding, you can then apply additional requirements because you're giving them some financial assistance. However, however, if somebody doesn't ask for that financial assistance or apply for it, um, there are some limits on how much you can control colors, materials, and, and specific details of the exterior of a building. The, the, there are tools that allow you even greater authority, uh, such as a heritage conservation district. Now that's under the, the Heritage Act. You, you'd have to do a heritage conservation district study and then enact a specific bylaw uh, giving you authority to require greater design 
uh, guidelines and, and restrictions uh, through architectural control. Um, so we'll explore that further in terms of what we can do uh, through the current CIP um, and its adoption to uh, um, create additional um, guidelines and direction for the design and redevelopment of buildings in the downtown and related incentive programs. Okay. Um, Sorry, yeah. I, I just see that Councillor Bonato has his hand up there. I think <laughs> he may want to provide some historical context and something. Actually, I, I wanted to correct Steve. On the 2006 incentives, we did have the Jelly Crab building that they applied right. for. There were a few yeah. buildings that applied for it. Secondly, we did look at uh, the uh, con con what do you call it? historical conservation area for the downtown core way back. And I know mm -hmm. council did not want to pass it to restrict at that time. So I'm hoping that it does come back. Uh, as a former member of the Heritage Committee, we didn't want that, and I and I know Linda and I have spoken to one developer concerning design of, of building, and then unfortunately it wasn't followed through. But um, I prefer, and I'm hoping that Council will bring that back through the CIP, or we can discuss it as Council. I'd like to see that happen in the downtown core and more control over how the Heritage buildings look. Um, and it was unfortunate that. Council didn't pass it in the past. Okay, Councillor Wigner. So, yeah, so just I, I guess um, that that sounds great. I, I love that we're going to be able to um, further discuss this a little bit more when the CIP comes through. Um, so I guess my my sort of follow up question to that is: Is there any way to actually create a specific bylaw that would speak, you know, to? Um, the upkeep of buildings. I know that we have the property standards, but something that is a little bit more um, specific to, you know, making sure that vacant buildings are maintained through, you know, their windows being washed and, and the, the facades of their buildings being maintained. Um, you know, we don't want to see any, you know, chipping and painting, you know, falling off and, and you know, stone that needs to be replaced. Um, is, you know, maybe there's a, is there a way that if, they've been vacant for more than six months that they are required to put something in the windows, like a, um, a wrap of some sort that would have historical photos so that when you drive through the town, you're not seeing these empty storefronts with either nothing in the windows, the windows dirty or paper, brown paper taped over the windows. Um, you know, we're trying as it, as it is with now the resurfacing of the, of the roads and the re the, you know, doing the pavers and Jack Dowling park. Um, you know, we really need to now look at these buildings and how they are perceived as people drive through, um, our community. Um, you know, not only visitors, but people who live here, who haven't invested, um, you know, their, their families here. So, um, is there any way that we as a council can create an actual bylaw that would speak to the upkeep maintenance and, and like I said, you know, the abandonment of, of some of these storefronts and um, be a little bit more, you know, or have a little bit more control, I guess you could say, as opposed to just property standards as a whole. Who wants to... <laughs> Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> uh, I can I can start. I, I haven't investigated kind of building upkeep specifically. Um, I, I, I know that municipalities have some authority when it comes to matters of health and safety and structural integrity of a building um, and property standards, as you mentioned. Um, when it comes to cosmetic um, things, you know, uh, needing a paint job or um, restoring brick that's uh, starting to deteriorate, um, you know, signage that's faded, lights that aren't working, um, th that kind of thing. I, I don't think that there's necessarily the, the authority through a bylaw to enforce those kinds of things. Uh, the general approach across Ontario is to try and create a framework for incentivizing those things. So assistance to ensure that um, when somebody wants to invest in the facade of their building or other improvements, that the, the process is streamlined. Uh, there's programs that they can tap into to try and 
get some assistance with that and um, you know, things like relief from fees. Um, but we can we could investigate that further. I, I, I'm not sure if there's things outside of the realm of kind of planning act authorities that uh, might deal with more of the ongoing kind of cosmetic appearance. Um, my best guess would it be it would be through more of a heritage conservation district plan under the Heritage Act, where you have more authorities under that legislation. Okay, so if, if we were to provide incentives or, or something like that, we could um, look into that when we when we bring this back with the CIP. Back. Not long. Yeah, yeah, as a way to promote it and make uh, it more affordable and achievable for building owners, but not necessarily that that would then allow you to if somebody didn't want to come forward and do that at their initiative um, and get some assistance that it, it wouldn't allow you to then force them to. Right. Okay. Okay. So that makes sense then. Um, okay. And then I just have one final one. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to get through this quickly. <laughs> um, so uh, we've had some concerns now that we have um, three uh, marijuana dispensaries coming to town. Um, so I know that we opted in and in order to, uh, you know, have any say or whatnot, it has to be sort of a higher government regulation uh, because once you opt in, you opt in. So you could have six, unfortunately, uh, come in town without being able to really, um, you know, say no. Uh, now, I did notice that um, Langley City um, had a report to council that offered a bylaw solution to diversify the retail in their downtown core. Um, so it was used to create a fair chance for multi-use services. So um, is this something that, you know, we could maybe look at as well with, um, you know, putting specific definitions pertaining to commercial use businesses and amendments in order to create, um, you know, more of a, a diversif diversified you know, pattern of businesses in the downtown core. So, you know, for example, if I guess if you, you know, you say, oh, well, I guess even with that maybe wouldn't work because again, it's through the, um, the, uh, the provincial government, but, you know, certain amounts of whatever, you know, store would be uh, 400 feet from another store, you know, something like that. So is there a way to sort of amend the current zoning bylaws in order to yeah. allow more of a variety in our downtown core as opposed to you know every other vacant store now being bought up and turned into a pot shop i'm just going to note that the mayor um, is gone because he lost his internet connection so i'm speaking without him acknowledging me i just I think he's trying to get back on so i'll start and then steve can talk about um, the policy side of this so the original report from staff was in 2019 we had outlined some of, the con um, some of the concerns with respect to specifically concentration and setback, and those were not defined yet. As a municipality, we are opted in. Um, I had specifically outlined in the report that there was no definition of numbers, that there was no restrictions on the number of cannabis stores in the community. There were certain criteria on where they could not be with respect to setbacks in terms of use schools and some other criteria. So at this point, unlike Langley, BC, which certainly appreciate what they've done, we are governed by Ontario's government and the planning principles that they have in place with respect to this and the $400 million in revenue that they've projected to come from these stores, uh, which we're cost sharing in, in terms of the, the returns on that. So while there's certain things that potentially could be changed in the legislation, we're not aware at this point that the government is undertaking any review, but certainly that's something that could be requested if there's enough concern. Um, and again, to your point, similar to the other conversation, there's nothing in our toolbox that would allow us to restrict which businesses would be making up the downtown configurations. It's a market economy. And unlike a mall, which can control their tenancy, these are privately owned buildings and they make the decisions on which businesses based on the market would be their tenants or owner operated. I'll turn it over to Steve in terms of the policy section, because that was something that we had identified would need to be developed uh, for the town by opting in. 
yeah, we, we uh, looked back to the regulations on uh, cannabis retail that the province issued. And one of the stipulations is that municipalities that have opted in um, firstly, cannot create a licensing system. I know that's not what you're asking about, but can't separately license uh, the sale of cannabis. You can require a business license, but not specifically the sale of cannabis. And then the other one is cannot pass a bylaw that distinguishes land or building use for cannabis from any other kind of retail use. So if you permit a retail use somewhere in a zone, that's all forms of retail and you can't say except cannabis. Um, so wherever the commercial zones permit retail, uh, they have to permit retail of cannabis inclusive with that. Um, you, the exception to that is, I think it's 150 meters of schools and child care centers, um, even though there may be zones that permit retail uses within that distance of those schools or child care centers, um, cannabis is not permitted by the province within that distance of the school. Um, the, the closest parallel I've seen in Ontario to what you're describing for Langley, BC is um, industrial areas, for example, some municipalities will say, you can have a gas store, gas station and convenience store at the edge of our industrial area, but you can only have one in this entire area, um, really to protect the land, say for true industry and manufacturing, but recognizing the edge of the area might be suitable for, you know, something that's more commercial. Um, in the downtown context, you could take the whole downtown and say, this it, within this entire area, the maximum floor area for this type of use shall be X. And that way you won't get a proliferation of that use or you're limiting it to an upset limit. But you, as I say, you'd have to do that for all forms of retail. Generally, uh, you couldn't do it, you know, X floor area for a furniture store, an X floor area for clothing, an X floor area for cannabis, you'd have to do kind of retail generally. Everyone. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's it for me. <laughs> Is uh, Wade back on? No? Okay. All right. Council Bernardo, please go ahead. Um, my question is in regards to the uh, by our uh, property standards bylaw. When is it coming back to council? For review. I know we spoke about it at the last meeting and um, I've got complaints coming at me regarding some properties within town and the fact that our bylaw officer just driving around could see them without being blind. So I'm just wondering when is it coming back? And, um, so through the deputy mayor, the uh, council passed a new bylaw, uh, property standards bylaw in 2019. And so again, that goes back to um, property standards being reactive and a formal complaint is required in order to act upon them. I understood that, but I understood at the last meeting it was gonna come back to council because we wanted to review it again. Yes, the bylaw enforcement policy will be coming forward to council for further review at a future meeting. At a future meeting, uh, when? three months from now, six months from now, a year from now? I guess that's what the question is. When is it coming back? That's at council's discretion of, how, of when you'd like to have it come back. How about we have it come back within the next two, two or three meetings, if possible? I can probably accommodate a September meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Council Bernardo. Uh, I, I do have a few items, but uh, does anybody else have any inquiries? No, not at this time. Okay, so I'll start off with uh, a couple that I have very quickly. Uh, this is for our planner, Steve. Um, I believe at some point or some time ago, there was a request to come back or at least have a report that would speak to the, I see the mayor's coming back on, that would speak to the inventory, the land inventory that uh, is in the possession of the town. Uh, and the reason why I'm sort of bringing this forward now, because I'm sure many of the councillors have probably been called or emailed with respect to what land do we have available, uh, because whether it's because people want to build a religious institution or a structure on it or for other purposes. Uh, so, Steve, is there something like that that will be coming back? Uh, I, I, my memory serves me that we talked about it at some point before, but 
if you could maybe speak to that briefly. Yeah, I do recall there was a question and some discussion about uh, vacant institutional land remaining in the town and uh, that there's very limited supply of that. Um, the MCR that the county is undertaking is doing a comprehensive countywide supply and demand exercise. So we've provided all of the land supply information to the county and they're going to tell us um, how that compares with their demand uh, that they're calculating for the county as a whole um, and whether there's additional land required. Um, so it could be part of that uh, update. There's some draft forecasts that the county has now given to each local municipality for staff review. And uh, we're in the process of reviewing that. So um, I don't have definitive timelines on when that information is going to be made public, but I, I'm thinking it's gonna be um, probably in the, in the early part of the fall. So September, October, um, which would probably be a good time to bring uh, a, a general update to council and some opportunity for questions and feedback on the results of the county work so far um, with additional detail on specifically how much land is available for the various kinds of uses um, in the town. Okay, perfect. So sometime in the fall, uh, at least that's uh, at least a window of time we could give to those who are making the inquiry. So thanks for that. Uh, this uh, other okay. inquiry, sorry. Sorry, I just see Denise put her hand up there. It looks like she wants to. Deputy Mayor, I just wanted to clarify when the question with respect to land in Shelburne, do you also mean that land that the town owns or yes, just, okay, yeah, so I can clarify uh, that. We have no inventory of land that we own other than as you're aware, we're looking at um, the potential end use of 420 Victoria Street and everything else that we own is currently being used other than parkland. And in fact, we had to purchase from the private sector owner a land for our municipal works operational facility as well as for the water tower. Mm, thank you for that. Actually, unlike, I should have been- Yeah, unlike other municipalities, we don't have a significant property that could be reviewed for surplus. Mm, thank you for that. And I should have been uh, clear with that, Steve. I, I meant what we owned. Um, because okay. the inquiry right. tend to yeah. come in about, you know, is there something that the town could put up that could accommodate some of these requests? So at least I know the answer for that. So maybe I should have known it before, but at least I know it for sure now. Uh, just on yeah. the surplus, uh, at Denise, uh, uh, this was one of my other questions. Sorry, my battery is going low. Is um, with respect to that property at Victoria, um, do you anticipate or when do you anticipate having further update on that? Yeah, Paul, we keep uh, dealing with additional soil and remediation review. So we're still in process. So we don't expect to be back to council until probably late 2021, early 2022. Um, we did make one organization that had presented to council that was interested in that potential property for their needs, aware of the, the timing as well. And they said that, that actually fit quite well with their potential expansion plans in 2022. Thank you. Uh, this is another question for you as well. Um, the, the bus service, we had talked about putting the weekend or at least the expansion of the weekend service on hold because of where we were at the time regarding the pandemic with things opening up. Uh, I believe we were scheduled to examine that maybe sometime this month. If you could speak to that, please. So, uh, the, the report that we provided gave us the review based on exactly where the province would be in terms of the staging. Um, we're going to be moving forward with a launch of the weekend service on July the 10th, running for five months. Uh, we're just looking at the draft agreement with Gray County, the town of Shelburne, as well as Dun uh, Dunder Southgate Township, because they are a partner in this as well. And we expect that we'll be ready to go on July the 10th. And then all the materials will be advertised and circulated by the county through their marketing team, as well as shared by us. And we hope that many people now with the two additional stops on the weekend will utilize the service. Hopefully we continue to be the most utilized on the route based on the last report that we got from them. Um, and this is my last question, uh, Denise, maybe you can answer this one too, is I know that we are about to embark on a master plan, park master plan discussion. I, I just forgot when uh, we're going to engage in that discussion. If you just tell me that quickly. 
certainly our original expectation is that we would have been started by now. Um, and we're going to come back and it in July with an update just because we did actually meet today on a project timeline. So I'll just give a brief overview. Um, the public consultation was impacted obviously because of COVID that we can't do public consultation uh, by virtual means, but it's just not as effective. So we're hoping that we will now launch the project in the fall of this year. And I'll be recommending to council that we stage it over a two year process or at least two fiscals so that the full report would be before council in April, but we can manage compartmentalizing some of those initiatives because many are those that council would like to see in terms of infrastructure projects, whether they're being completed in 2021 or 2022. Um, and we're gonna be using our bang the table to ensure that we have significant stakeholder engagement and significantly expanding that audience from what was undertaken in the 2009 plan. So I think um, we wanna really reflect some of the DEI uh, requirements in terms of what needs to be identified in terms of services, particularly in recreation and being more responsive. And we also talked about the critical need to uh, put a lens on all the land that we own and its use and ensure that it's, it's equitably managed with respect to access. And that would be part of the, the review that we're doing. And then at the same time, we're still waiting to hear about the grant for the SDR service delivery review because the two of them are significantly intertwined in terms of future needs, as well as council's request for us to come back with a report at some point in August, I believe, on the third party management and how that may affect recreation in the future. So sorry, that was a very long answer. And Steve, if you want to say anything, because your firm is going to um, walk us through the project management. I think that uh, covers it. One of the um, um, parts that we're going to obviously start off with, as Denise mentioned, is the engagement plan and uh, seeing what we can achieve with uh, specific stakeholders even uh, before the fall, potentially, because uh, there's partners out there that we, we could potentially meet with or, or are in dialogue with anyway on other initiatives um, that, that we can be talking to about uh, their plans and, and potential partnerships in the future. Um, so we're going to we're going to develop a more detailed work plan on how we roll out the, the um, awareness of the project and the opportunities for everybody to participate. Okay. Thank you. I'll officially turn the chair back over to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. I had some technical difficulties and had to change locations here, but it, it seems to be resolved now. Uh, any other uh, inquiries? No? Okay, so we can move into reports then. So the first report um, is, uh, is something that's back on the agenda from a previous meeting. And this is with respect to the proposed uh, telecom tower at 713 Industrial Roads. It looks like uh, we have some different options to consider. So um, Steve, do you wanna sort of guide us through what, uh, what <clears throat> excuse me, what, what they've come up with in terms of uh, alternatives? Certainly. So um, it's generally um, summarized within my report uh, P2021-26 in the agenda package. Uh, the, the recommendation there is essentially the same as at the prior uh, meeting when this was considered, which was on May 10th, um, with the addition of five different um, options on the various potential uh, height and style of the tower. Uh, which is uh, there for council to um, discuss and, and provide direction on. So we've, we've worked with the applicant and, and Mr. Dom Claros is here, I, I see as well tonight, to um, specifically determine if there are more viable options uh, for the tower height and style um, to have it fit uh, more appropriately within the urban context. Um, so my report provides a little bit of commentary about that. Obviously we haven't engaged any specialists in you know, visual impact assessment or anything like that, but I think the, 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 the images that the applicant has provided uh, through the renderings um, are helpful. Uh, they illustrate obviously the different heights uh, of the first three options with uh, this, the original proposal illustrated in the first view with a 50 meter tripole tower and you can see how 
um, you know, it's certainly still very visible as you get down to the 45 meter and 40 meter height. But at the 40 meter height, um, you know, depending where you're looking at it from, it's not projecting significantly above other overhead infrastructure that you see uh, in the image. Um, and then the two different styles, um, alternatives identified with what's called a slim self-support, which basically means it's more like a tripod. It's, it's very, it's wider at the base and gets narrower as you go towards the top, kind of like a hydro um, tower. And then the monopole option, um, which is um, basically just a single consistently, uh, consistent diameter pole from top to bottom uh, with a 40 meter height. Uh, in addition to the images, we had some um, discussion with the applicant about whether there's any possibility to integrate uh, a community feature such as a, a flag or something, um, uh, basically to help disguise what this pool is for or to make additional use of it. Um, however, the, the only type of pool style that can support a flag is the, the monopole. And um, in order to um, use that style, um, they, they can only go to a maximum height of 40 meters. And at that lower height, it's 10 meters lower than the original proposal. And they need the full, you know, five plus meter top area of the tower to put the antenna on. So you can't have the flag up where the antenna are. If, if the tower could be higher with that style, it might work, but um, because you have, you know, the antenna at that top part, it's not really available for a flag. So in general, um, from my own assessment and, and based on discussions with staff, we thought that the, the, the 40 meter um, you know, monopole or the 40 meter tripole are most in keeping with what you would find in an urban area um, where these have to be located in an urban area and reduce the visual impact. Um, but as I say, the, the five options are there for council to um, provide direction on. Okay. So if there's any um, questions about the report or any of the visuals, um, I'm, I'm happy to try and answer them for you. Great, thank you. The, the, the one that stood out to me as, as being the, the most appealing or, or at least the, the least obtrusive, I think was, was the 40 uh, meter monopole. Um, I mean, that, that's not based on, on, on anything other than, you know, just, just simple, you know, visual aesthetic, I think. Um, thoughts from, from the rest of the group? Councillor Fegan? Hey, yes, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Steve, the, you, you said that they need the top five meters of the pole in order to incorporate a flag, correct? It was no, it, just that they're using the top, I, can't, I think it was three to five meters or something like that for the antenna. So, um, because the antenna will be there, that reduce that rules out the ability to put a flag at the top. Right, but kind of uh, outside the box thinking here, if with the monopole, if we were to increase it that extra five meters, but still incorporate a very large flag to kind of match that, is that something that is doable? It is. Uh, the response from the applicant was that that would be significantly more costly. So that's. That, that's the response that was our suggestion as well in our question. But um, when we first asked about into incorporating a, a pool, basically, the, I think it, it's to the point where it affects the viability of the project for the applicant. Okay. I, I just mentioned it because to me, if we can disguise it as a flagpole, um, I might not be opposed to the extra height. If we can have a nice large flag, that's, that's kind of a really nice feature. Okay, um, I, I saw Councillor Bonato's hand and then Councillor Wagner. Just, uh, I, I, I was sort of thinking the same as Councillor Fegan about increasing the height, but just another, another thought. Is there, at the lower level, is there other things that, like a flag or other things that can be put at a lower level rather than the higher level? Where, where they have to put the communication or antennas? So you mean like putting a flag 
uh, say, just below the antenna? Yeah. Um, I thought about that as well. The, the only um, potential um, perception of that is that the flag is flying at half mast or something like that, or it's not where it's well, supposed to be on the pole? No, I, 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 I'm, the way I'm thinking, we see the flag and the, the communication part is on top of it. It's not at half mast, I don't think. They realize mm -hmm. something on top of that. So I don't know if it would help to just quickly put the image on screen. Is that all right, Mr. Mayor? I, I don't see anything yet. Oh, there we go. Looks like it's, uh, there we go. Come yeah. On. So, yeah, the, if we're, this is the, the applicant advised that this is the type of pole you would need to use to incorporate a flagpole. And I gather the reason for that is with any kind of lattice structure, you know, the pole can get all wrapped around it or the flag can get all wrapped around it and, mm -hmm. and tangled. So this, the parts that you see that aren't just a, you know, consistent white pole, these are the various antenna at the top. So I don't know if that's like maybe the top fifth of the tower or so are, are occupied by those antenna. So the, the, the highest point that a flag could go would be kind of, if you can see my cursor yeah. right about here. Yeah. So, I mean, it would still read as a flagpole. It just looks like it's about 75% up the pole instead of at the top. Yeah, it doesn't look like half mass to me. No, not quite. It's just lowered a little bit. And I don't know if that might be perceived the wrong way or if that would be acceptable. Um, I don't know. Just my thoughts, it's not a problem. That's something I can, uh, I, well, I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you want to specifically see if uh, the applicant would have any concern with that. Yeah, Dom's online here, isn't he? Yeah. Are you, are you there, Dom? Dom Long, but he's not with us. He's, he's here. Okay. Um, yeah, so so Dom, did, did you hear uh, Councillor Bernardo's question? Hi. Hello, can, yeah. can anyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can oh, hear you. Okay, awesome. Um, yes, so, sorry, it was saying that the, the host, uh, oh, okay, perfect, sorry. There we go. When, when they stopped the, the video and then restarted, it gets all messy. Um, yes, I, I did. So putting a, a flag below the antenna is certainly an option. Um, it was near the, the top of the pole that would not be an option because we would need um, the elevation in order to uh, accommodate the, the antenna um, and the uh, wireless uh, internet equipment. Um, lowering the pole um, by 10 meters made it so that we had to work to engineer um, the way the carriers could put their antennas uh, and the wireless internet service providers could put their antennas on the pole so that there would be maximum sharing in each bay or each kind of section. Usually a carrier um, takes about three to three and a half meters um, of space on a pole of vertical height. Um, and just working to make sure and ensure that um, the way they would position their antennas, we could fit multiple carriers at each level um, so that there'd be room at the base or lower down below the, the telecom carriers for um, one or two wireless internet service providers who'd want to provide um, wireless service to the more rural, uh, excuse me, community. Um, and so underneath that, we would certainly be able to put a, a flag um, if, if that was something, uh, if that was the direction council wished to proceed with the style of poll. Okay. The, uh, the, the clerk just sent me a note um, suggesting that we, we could check with, uh, you know, federal flag protocols to, to make sure that that's not, you know, putting us offside with, with any, uh, any sort of formal um, protocol. I, I literally just did a, a bit of a sketch on, on the picture that was included in my agenda. And I mean, you know, Simply from an aesthetic point of view, I, I don't think it looks terrible. Um, being under the infrastructure, I mean, it, it's pretty clear that that you know the that the antennas and whatnot that are at the top are, are sort of you know different from the rest of the pole. So, um, but I, I think we 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 would do well to, to to check and make sure that we're not running afoul of of any flag protocols. But but at least if that's an option, and, and I mean it's it's logistically possible that that's 
good to know at this point. Um, Councillor Wagner. Yes, thank you very much for your emails. Um, yeah, I guess that was just sort of my sentiments as well. Um, Walter kind of covered what I was thinking of potentially suggesting as well. Um, you know, I like even Councillor Fegan's uh, suggestion there too. I, I know that, um, you know, you did speak to the, the cost factor. Is there any way to potentially divulge that uh, amongst the carriers that you're going to have on the tower. So if it, if it does increase the, the fee a little bit, um, that each one of them is sort of separately, uh, you know, build, but equally build in order to sort of recoup that potential extra cost. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, the, the beneficial uh, point to that would be, it would be a little bit taller, right? So at that point, um, uh, you know, maybe signals will be better or, or whatnot. Um, but I definitely, uh, I think if we have to do anything in the location that it currently is in, I, I think in order to multi-use this and to get, you know, the community on board where it doesn't look like an eyesore, I think a flag, you know, attached would, um, would be our best bet. Thank you. Okay. And anybody else? Any strong preferences amongst the five options? No? Okay. Um, does anybody want to make a motion? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and make one. Um, I mean, the, the recommendation from, from staff is, is that we do provide the concurrence. Um, as I mentioned, I, I'm sort of partial to option five. Uh, so with, uh, with that in mind, I'll make the following motion. Uh, be resolved the council receives report P 2021-26 for information and the council directs town staff to advise Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada in writing that Land Squared on behalf of the proponent shared Tower Inc has satisfactorily completed its consultation with the town of Shelburne. The town of Shelburne is satisfied with the public consultation process undertaken by Land Squared on behalf of the proponent and does not require any further consultation with the public and that the town of Shelburne concurs with the proposal by land squared on behalf of the proponent to construct a shared tower wireless telecommunications antenna on the subject property located at 713 Industrial Road, specifically the following preferred option. And that would be option five, which is the monopole tower with a 40 meter height. Can I get a seconder for that motion? Uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson. Any discussion on that? Councillor Bonato and then Councillor Fegan. On your motion, is there any part of it that we may be able to add that a flag be put at some point on that tower? What? Um, could, could we go so far, Jennifer, as to say, I'm wondering, uh, and, and that a flag be located um, below the antenna hardware subject to confirming um, that such placement will not contravene federal flag protocols, does something like that make sense? Does that satisfy your, your concern there, Councilor Bernardo? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor, are you okay with adding that as an amendment? Okay. Uh, Councilor Fegan? Councillor Bernardo hit the point that I was looking for. Perfect. All right, any further discussion? Okay, call the question then, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that's carried. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Dom, thanks for uh, taking the time to, to rework that and, and come back with something that I think uh, is, is certainly going to be more, more acceptable in the eyes of the community, so I appreciate that. Yeah, and thank you very much for council for meeting us again and the first time and Steve and Jennifer for all your uh, help. It's been a pleasure working with everyone. Great. Thank you, sir. Okay, take take care. care. Okay, next up is uh, another report from the town planner regarding the final approval of uh, 900 Main Street East. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I think the report is fairly self-explanatory. There's quite a bit of information there, so I won't uh, go through it all. 
Um, the purpose of the report is really to bring this subdivision uh, to its final point of approval. Um, the, the process with subdivision plans and condominium plans is that uh, it starts with a conditional approval with ex an extensive list of conditions requiring things like detailed engineering design drawings, uh, agency clearances and sign off you know, from utilities, in this case, from the Ministry of Transportation, from the county, from the NVCA, um, requires landscaping plans, street naming, which has uh, been approved by council for this development, um, things like zoning compliance uh, certificate. Um, all of that has now been completed. There are a couple of um, agency clearances that remain that are identified in my report. Um, one of them um, has been going back and forth uh, recently with uh, Hydro. And uh, sorry, I'm just pulling up. Yeah, with Hydro One, they are in receipt of the composite utility plans and uh, uh, just clarifying a couple of things. But so, so it's really an administrative item there. Hydro One will be providing its clearance eventually. I wanted to mention one uh, item specifically with respect to hydro service that wasn't pre previously identified for this subdivision and came up through the detailed design review. Um, if you can bear with me here, I'm just going to quickly put the plan on screen. Did that come up, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, we're good. So through the review of the hydro servicing of the development and the capacity needs, um, Hydro One has identified that some additional transformers are needed. Basically, it's to step down the voltage to the required voltage for the for the subdivision. So there are hydro lines overhead along the east side of County Road 124. Uh, what this transformer will do is step that down to the required local voltage in the subdivision. And um, they, we've been working with the, the applicant uh, field gate as well as uh, Hydro One to determine an appropriate location for those. Um, Hydro One has identified that uh, for these specific transformers, they actually need a, a small block of land that they will um, take into their ownership. Um, and it's land that was otherwise supposed to be dedicated to the town. Now it will be a very small area of land um, block 222 is the large wooded area where the Besley drain flows through the site. Um, all of that environmental land will be conveyed to the town. Uh, you can see this kind of dashed box up here. That's not um, the location of where, uh, or, or the shape or, or dimensions of the, of the block that Hydro One needs, but through a separate reference plan, there would be a small dedication off the corner of that parcel. Um, it's actually not part of the wooded area or the environmental constrained land. There's, there's an old uh, cattle ramp there and some remnant fencing, an old driveway off the east side of County Road 124. So we've reviewed that with the county and, and for the purposes of a little utility block, they um, seemed like they would be okay with, with access. So um, that's where Hydro One is proposing to uh, put some of these, um, basically it's a pad mount transformer, green, those green hydro boxes that you see along the side of certain roads. So I just wanted to raise that. That's why Hydro One has been separately identified as still requiring a clearance um, and that we're working with them to finalize that detail. Um, the process there would be after the plan is registered, uh, we would seek to ensure that um, that little block has been um, surveyed and conveyed to Hydro One before the town receives the rest of the block that will avoid any unnecessary administrative work whereby we would have to dedicate it from the town to Hydro One after the fact. Um, for the Nottosaga Valley Conservation Authority, um, they require a copy of the executed subdivision agreement to provide their clearance. Just stop sharing my screen here. Um, and you may recall, I think it was um, May 31st when council authorized the subdivision agreement for this development. We're still putting the finishing touches on that with uh, final lists of drawings and so forth, uh, minor details in the agreement, um, but that will be executed in, in short order. Um, and so that will allow the NVCA to provide their clearance as well. 
um, I've, I've itemized throughout the report all of the various conditions that this development is subject to and explain how they've been addressed or will be addressed uh, through the subdivision agreement and other mechanisms. Uh, and since this report was filed for the agenda, um, the uh, owner has provided a certified copy of the subdivision M plan that I just had on screen. Uh, so it's certified by their surveyor, uh, JD Barnes, as well as by the owner of Shelburne 89 Developments Limited. Um, so everything is in order. Um, as I say, there's a few things still being tidied up in the subdivision agreement for it to be executed. Uh, a couple of agency clearances. Uh, the purpose really of bringing the report forward at this time is to ensure that when those last items are in place, staff have the ability with council's blessing to uh, to give the final approval on the plan so that it can be registered. Uh, following registration, um, all of the streets uh, and uh, environmental blocks and parkland and so forth will be dedicated to the town. All of the commercial um, stormwater uh, mixed use and future development blocks will be created for uh, the various functions that they serve and all of the lots for the residential uses will be created so that uh, the owners can start to pull building permits. Uh, the first building permit that, uh, well, really there's two building permits that we expect probably in the month of July. One is for the sanitary pumping station that's under construction, uh, that the underground work for that has been done. Um, and the other is for the new food land on the uh, commercial block. Um, so things are moving ahead uh, with this development and um, the site plan uh, agreement has been authorized for the larger commercial block as well as of the last meeting. Um, we've obviously consulted with all the various agencies. There's been extensive engineering reviews as well. And uh, that's just summarized in the report. Um, so I've attached a copy of the plan as well as the clearance letters received. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Steve or any, any concerns, uh, Councilor Bonato? Uh, on the hydro block, uh, Nottawasaga, they know about that being dedicated from the town to hydro? Um, not yet, but as soon as we have the details from Hydro One on exactly where they're locating the block, we've advised them that we will be sending that to the NBCA uh, to see if they have any comments or concerns, because uh, that uh, part of the property, although it's not close to the water course and not within the wooded area, it is within their regulation limit. So it's likely that a permit will be required from the NBCA in order for, for them to construct those utility vaults um, in that area. Yeah, I'm just wondering in case they deny or don't want it there, what other options are available to Hydro? Yeah, we're, we're hoping that will uh, not be an issue, but that's something we will review with the NVCA. Um, if it is, um, you know, they're going to have to look at other uh, other location options. But um, fortunately, it's outside of the um, protected feature. Yeah. Okay, that's just my one question. Okay. Anybody else? Councillor Wagner. Thank you very much, Mayor Mills. Um, just a quick question here. Um, with this now in place, or if you know we vote to finalize this, when? Uh, just to refresh my memory, when is it expected that the commercial block will be ready for um, retail use? So uh, they want to start site servicing uh, in July. Um, they, they would probably be started now if everything was, was finalized, but we're just working out the final details of the agreement and the security, et cetera. Um, they hope to have the main tenant uh, open in the first quarter of 2022. Um, there may be some of the smaller tenants who can build more quickly uh, open before the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Steve? Oh, okay. So, uh, so the recommendation uh, contained in the agenda 
uh, reads as follows, be it resolved the council receives report P 2021-27 regarding final approval of the Shelburne 89 Developments Limited Plan of Subdivision and the council authorizes final approval of the Shelburne 89 Developments Limited Plan of Subdivision file number DPS 18-01 under section 51 of the Planning Act and directs the clerk to sign the municipal approval on the plan of subdivision M plan prepared by JD Barnes Limited dated June 24th, 2021 and certified by the owner and surveyor entitled plan of subdivision of the west half of lot one concession one old survey geographic township of Melanchthon now in the town of Shelburne County of Dufferin and to have copies of the approved plan of subdivision forwarded to the land registry office uh, for registration upon execution of the subdivision agreement and the clerk's receipt of the following clearance letters. And those are forthcoming from Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority and Hydro One. Can I get a mover and seconder for that? Uh, Councillor Bonato, seconded by Councillor Wegner. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Okay. Um, is that it for you, Steve? Um, so there are around? some zoning matters in the next report. So um, if I'm needed, I, I can stick around for that one as sure. well. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so the next report is from the Director of Development and Operations regarding 604 Owen Sound Street, uh, where there's an encroachment on municipal property and some parking concerns. So this was first raised uh, last fall, I believe, and it's time for a revisit. So Jim? Uh, through your worship. Uh, yes, at the September 14th, 2020 council meeting, uh, council members discussed uh, during uh, council inquiries uh, segment uh, about parking concerns, traffic congestion, and, and encroachment of retail products at a property uh, uh, 604 Owen Sound Street. Uh, with the inclement weather settling in at that time, it was uh, decided that this item would be looked at in uh, 2021. So staff did review uh, concerns noted uh, with the property. Uh, bylaw number 10-1992 was passed in February uh, two, uh, 1992, amending the zoning bylaw uh, 10-1972 to permit the following on the property. Uh, a restaurant and variety store with a maximum area of 111.48 square meters. Uh, in the existing single detached dwelling, and uh, notwithstanding parking requirements of section 3.19B, parking area requirements, and section uh, D, ingress and egress parking uh, for spaces at 604 Owen Sound Street for commercial uses, uh, they may have direct access to James Street. <clears throat> Uh, the above special zoning was carried forward in the town zoning bylaw 16-1992, uh, uh, passed in May 11th, uh, 1992, and the property was rezoned to C2 uh, with the current zoning bylaw uh, 38-2007 was passed in September of 2007. Uh, the C2 uh, zoning permits food, uh, food store but does not specifically permit parking spaces for commercial use. Uh, with direct access to Jane Street. However, if uh, direct access uh, to Jane Street on the existing property prior to uh, bylaw number 38-2007 uh, and has continued since then, uh, the parking configuration can continue under the original permission granted in 1992. Uh, if parking spaces are no longer provided on the property with direct access to Jane Street, uh, the parking configuration is no longer permitted. Uh, up note, the original zoning establishment established in 1992 and current zoning do not permit for uh, infer permission for a type of structure or retail display encroachments uh, on Jane Street right of way, uh, nor any special permissions for on-street parking along Jane Street uh, and it must be in compliance with the town's traffic bylaw. In the summer of 2011, uh, the director of public works was con contacted our town planner with concerns regarding uh, the encroachment of the canopy structures and retail displays uh, on the street. Uh, 
Uh, meeting was scheduled uh, for August 3rd, 2011, and the uh, meeting was on site uh, with a discussion with the owner uh, of the retail goods and the canopy that they were not permitted in the right of way and should be pulled back inside the property line. The owner did take some measures at that time. Uh, however, uh, with staff turnover, uh, heavy staff turnover in the last few years, uh, there was no further follow-up uh, regarding the issue since 2011 and we can find any documentation until very recently. Uh, <clears throat> when Jane Street was re uh, reconstructed, uh, rollover curbs and paved shoulders were provided uh, to maintain some uh, parking spaces to keep traffic off the travel portions of the road. In short, any encroachments on Jane Street right away that are limiting uh, the safe parking of vehicles in, in the paved shoulder areas are not permitted in the zoning bylaw. And it's completely within the town's discretion uh, to have uh, the retail displays uh, removed. Uh, if any town uh, right away is uh, being permitted to be used for commercials oper operations uh, on the property, a permit or similar, similar documentation of the permission will need to be considered to detail which parts of the right of way may be used for what purposes and when this may occur. Uh, and then including uh, uh, some kind of liability insurance there too, to make sure the town's covered in, in an amount of at least uh, $2 million. Uh, as parking of the vehicles on the street, the current bylaw is silent with regards to parking restrictions on uh, the north and south side of Jane Street between Owen Sound and Willow. Uh, <clears throat> a traffic bylaw amendment would be required should council wish to have parking restrictions in that area. Uh, should parking restrictions be requested, it's anticipated that this, the parking of vehicles will then take place on the west side of Owen Sound Street, uh, creating additional hazards with people crossing Owen Sound to get to the, uh, the store. It's staff's recommendation uh, to enforce the town's current zoning bylaw and not permit any encroachment into the town right of way as paving up the parking area on the right, on the right of way uh, was done during the reconstruction of the sister streets. And uh, it was to provide specifically parking on, on site parking for this location. Uh, so financial impacts currently we don't have any. Uh, policy implications would be just enforcement of our zoning, Shelburne, Town of Shelburne zoning bylaw 38-2007 uh, and our consultations were with our town, town planner and our municipal bylaw enforcement officer. And my apologies for this one, it's uh, left to work one of my other uh, last reports, but it does uh, meet with uh, council's strategic priorities target T7 for promote partnerships and collaborations. Okay, um, thoughts, comments, questions, Councillor Fegan and then Councillor Buffett. This, this is one that I did bring forward uh, whenever it was, or last year I guess it was, or the year before, uh, with concerns in regards to the parking. Um, I, I do want to make note that I don't, the whole purpose of bringing this forward was not to create issues for the business owner. And um, one, of the, one of the things I want to make sure that we're doing is that we're working with him to ensure that we're not hurting his business in any way, shape, or form. Um, I don't necessarily think that we need to restrict parking all along the north side of Jane Street, uh, but I will say this much, even when he did have those, the, the um, canopies pulled back and there were parking spaces available, I noticed for a very long time that people still don't use them. They, they weren't coming into using them as parking spaces, they still parked on the road. The, the issue is not the business owner, it's more education on the public who are attending his facilities. And I think the, the most important thing we need to discuss here is how do we get that education across to ensure that that corner stays safe. Okay. Uh, Councillor Buffett. Yes, I uh, just have a question regarding um, part of the report that refers to that um, the having the right of way being used and the liability insurance requirements. And that discussion, was that discussion had recently with the owner Brent at all, or do we know that? Uh, 
when when we were on site and met with him uh, last year, that was mentioned that that does present a, a liability issue for the town because it is part of our municipal you know, road allowance or street allowance right away there. Uh, that if something did happen, uh, slip, trip, or fall, or something in there, we'd we'd still be involved as it being our property. So, right. But did did the um, owner did Brent say anything about? whether he had an issue with doing that, if, if that was something that was decided? Uh, no, he didn't really mention that. Uh, just his concerns there that if he did have to pull back his awning and his produce, that might be the make or break for the business. So that was right. his main uh, focus point. And as far as the parking goes, like with the parking across the street and where it is now, if we were to leave that the way it is, is that going to be an issue or do we, are you still suggesting that we should do, do something about that? Like for example, putting some no parking signs on the, the side where the, the actual business is. And then on the other side where there's room for parking, leave that as is. Yeah, it, it's, it would be better to have it open on both sides as uh, the, the recommendation says there, because there is, uh, some pretty heavy congestion in there at certain times of the day. So that, that's why we had suggested that it, it be opened up so those parking spots can be used again. But at least if uh, parking on the south side continues, at least that gives some break in there too. But uh, we're just worried that if we do no parking out in front, as we mentioned, that that'll, that'll put more pressure on Owen Sound Street and uh, people, pedestrian traffic crossing at, that fairly busy street. <laughs> so are you saying that you would prefer to have the parking on both sides? Because that's the part of, I'm having a problem understanding. It. It's almost like two positive, mega negative, or vice versa. I'm not quite sure what we're being asked to, to go along with here. Yeah, ideally parking on both sides, uh, have him pull his stuff back so that uh, those parking spots that were uh, put in in the, uh, uh, with the construction of the sister streets are again useful to keep people off the travel portion of the roads. So we would have more parking, but no business. So we wouldn't need any parking. That's my concern. I, I personally, myself, I don't see how that opening up of two parking spots would be the make or break for, uh, you could always pull the produce back and use part of his uh, front lawn for that too. So, okay. anybody else? <clears throat> uh, Councillor Wagner, and then back to Councillor Fegan. Thank you very much, Mary Mills. Um, I, I guess this is where we're, we're stuck in, in sort of a, a rock and a hard place here is, um, you know, if, if we, we can't leave it the way it is, cause clearly it's, it's not, uh, working. We we're having the congestion of people pulling up and parking. Um, so if we provide the parking and he has to pull back some of his produce and, and utilize a little bit more of his lawn, um, you know, he has a, a, a genuine concern about that. Um, but, if we allow, you know, or if we have the parking or we don't have the parking, let's, let's say, and we, we turn that into a non-parking, um, uh, you know, street, then he has to provide the liability of the $2 million. So uh, I guess it's, it's what's he comfortable with doing. And, and at the same time, I, we have these bylaws and rules in place uh, for a reason. And how can we expect the town to comply with what we have as rules if we don't apply those rules to everyone equally and the same? So, um, yeah, this is this is a tricky one. That's for sure. I don't think that people will start parking on Owen Sound. Um, I can't speak for everyone, unfortunately, but I, I just, I don't, it's such a busy road that I think that they will continue either moving forward on Jane Street and Park, or they'll they'll wrap around the business, um, which I can't remember what street that's called right now, um, and, and they'll park over there, as opposed to parking or choosing to park on, on Owen Sound. But um, 
you know, right now as it stands, they're, they're just continuing to park in, in front on, on Jane street of the business. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's all I kind of have to say. And I'm sort of stuck with my decision as well as to what moves forward. Okay. Uh, Councillor Fegan. Jim, you have in that your, your presentation here, you were talking about the possibility of actually making just what, let's say that would we decide on just the north side of Jane Street being no parking. Is there a possibility of choosing a certain portion of that, maybe coming only halfway down on the north side and working with Brent to make sure, that, just try to find a, a compromise in here. Is that a possibility? I see Jennifer's coming online. Yeah, through your worship, if, if that is a wish of council, that, that is a possibility there that you can uh, uh, set out a portion of up the north side of Jane Street as a no parking zone. Jennifer? Um, through your worship, the only thing is that that's hard to define in the traffic bylaw and would provide for difficulties for enforcement. Is, is, is there a way to do it? Like, you know, no parking between the marked signs? I, I've seen that. In, in other communities and, and then there's at least two sort of defined points. I would recommend that we provide um, measurements. Uh, measurements, yes, measurements. Okay. Well, I, I, I guess there's a few different options at council's disposal right now. We, we could simply receive the report, um, direct nothing, um, we, we could, um, look at a, a no parking option as Councillor Fegan just discussed. We could accept the recommendation um, or if, if everybody wants more time to kind of ruminate on this, we could defer it. Um, oh, anybody want to motion? Just out of curiosity, Jim, how much consultation have we had with Brent at this point? Uh, the majority of that was last year. So uh, when we had originally, uh, uh, similar to the uh, the uh, director of public works at that time went to uh, visit with him in 2011. Uh, originally, he was uh, amenable to pulling back, and then that that kind of changed that uh, he wanted to revert back to his current conditions of what he's doing there, and that's where the no parking idea came up. So originally, he was okay with that, and then kind of changed his mind on that again since he was going to lose that area for retail produce. So. Okay, then Mr. Mayor, is there a possibility that we make a motion then, and I'll put it forward, um, that we defer this until further consultation can be had with the business owner and try to come up with a compromise in conjunction with his needs as well? Sure. Uh, is, is there a seconder for that motion? Yeah. Councillor Buffett, okay. Um, so, so what I would suggest, Councillor Fegan, um, that we'll re receive the report um, in, incorporate that part and then uh, defer the matter pending further consultation with uh, with the property owner um, and, and business owner of 604 on Sound Street. That sounds, okay. good. that sounds good, sure. Okay, any discussion on that motion? Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that's carried. Okay, well, we'll revisit that again uh, at, at a later date. Uh, before we move on to uh, the CAO's report regarding fee waivers, uh, why don't we take a, a, a quick 10 minute uh, bio break and stretch your legs. <laughs> 